Amen. Thank you. Presence and power. That's exactly what we want. God's presence and the power of God to move mightily as we open God's word. And that's what I love to do is open God's word. So if you need a Bible, please raise your hand and a faithful volunteer will get you a Bible. We've been going through the book of Isaiah and we finally get to the middle of the book. We're in chapters 36 through 39. Uh, So you can go ahead and turn there. David mentioned that I'm the middle school pastor, and that is exactly what I love to do. I love middle school students. Uh, Middle school students are incredible. They are my favorite, by the way. Um, But they're they're incredible people, and and God does some incredible things with, with middle school students. This year, I've just been overwhelmed at the goodness of God, of what God has been doing uh, on Wednesday nights at Lug. We've been going through this series called Truth, and we've been looking at the truth of who God is, the truth of who we are, and then how do we respond to those two crucial truths. And uh, last week, last Wednesday, we celebrated 12 students that were baptized. And uh, no, you can clap for that. that that's, that's great. One of, one of the students, sixth grade girl, one of the students lives with her aunt. She goes home. She's telling uh, her, her aunt everything that God's been doing in her life and ask her aunt if she wanted to be baptized. And the aunt was baptized as well. And so, it, I mean, precious moment. And Will has actually captured a lot of that on video. So you guys go ahead and watch this. Doesn't that move you? Doesn't that move you to see these students being baptized? That's that's what we want. That's what David was praying for. Power and presence. Just right now, check yourself. Are you are you wanting to be moved this morning? Don't just be here. Don't just be here. Don't take for granted church. Don't take for granted opening up God's word. Don't take for granted the body of Christ, believers, present. God can interact and meet with us this morning. I want that. I want that. I don't want to just have a little talk and then leave and say, oh, that was a good word. I want transformation. Amen. That's that's what I want. And and so we go to God's word, and, and, and this is a hinge moment. Chapter 36 through 39 is a a hinge moment in the book of Isaiah. It is a crucial moment where the nation of Israel, the, the, the city of Jerusalem, is really having to pay attention at what's happening at this moment, a hinge moment. So what is a hinge moment? Uh, we know what hinge moments are. It's, an, it's when there's an opportunity to overcome an obstacle. That's what a hinge moment is. When there's an opportunity to overcome an obstacle. And so we have several hinge moments in our lives. A hinge moment in my life 
I remember this very clearly was when I moved from middle school to high school. And moving from middle school to high school, I actually moved from Tampa, Florida to Valdosta, Georgia, to very different places, okay? So, I, you know, in middle school, I was known as the clown, as a goofball, and I really wanted to, to try to be serious for a second. I mean, I'm in high school. I got to be mature. So I was like, all right, I got this. I can do this. So first day of class, here's my opportunity. I'm sitting there. I'm in the front row. The teacher's there. And she, she begins to speak, and I'm listening. And she says, all right, class, I need everyone to pull out their folder. And, and I'm like, what in the world is a folder? <laughs> and I, I reach into my book bag, and I'm looking through what in the world could a folder be? And I, and I made sure I had everything on the syllabus. So I pull the syllabus out, and I'm looking through it. There's nothing about a folder anywhere. And so the teacher then, she says, um, look, you know, having this folder is, is very important. It's going to be 10% of your overall grade. I'm like, gosh, you have to bring it every single day to class. So I just, I raised my hand and I said, ma'am, what, what is a folder? And she said, it's right there on your, your desk. Oh, you mean a folder? And, and the classroom just erupts laughing. They think that I'm poking fun at this teacher. And she, she's like, all right, you think you're a clown? I was like, no, I'm trying to, I'm just confused. And I have several of these moments in my life. Another time, uh, very, a hinge moment in my life was getting my driver's license. Going to be able to drive, you know, have a job, you know, I'm hold it down, go visit my friends. It's going to be great. Hinge moment. And so I'm, I'm out there, you know, doing my driver's test. And, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good. This is about to be a breeze. Want to see me parallel park? Not a problem. Practice that. Got that. Breeze. All right. So he's like, all right, you did great on all that, you know, everything. Now, now I just, let's just drive around and you're just going to follow some instructions. So we're driving. No problem. Make sure I got both hands on the steering wheel. Just impress this guy. And then he, he tells me this. He looks at me and says, all right, I want you to turn at the next red light. And I ask him the light is green. Do you want me to turn here or do you want me to wait until there's a red light and then turn at the red light? <laughs> he looks at me and says, turn at the next red light. Say no more. So I just keep driving past one light, <laughs> past another light. And he, and I could tell that he's getting frustrated. And he says, you were supposed to turn at that last light. I said the light was green. I was confused. He thought I was trying to be a clown. This, this was a hinge moment for me to get my driver's license. I'm thinking about all the freedom that I'm going to have. And, he, and I filmed the test because I couldn't follow instructions. He thought I was trying to poke fun at him. And, and so that was a hinge moment in my life, failing that test. Went back the next week and got it. It was awesome. But those aren't really hinge moments. You know, a hinge moment, we don't have a ton of these moments in our life. Hinge moments are, are life-changing moments. Another hinge moment, life-changing moment, was the birth of, of my children. I have a little girl, my, my daughter, her name is Jubilee. She's awesome. She's the most adorable little thing in the world. Um, just beautiful, brought, brought so much joy in my life. And um, also the birth of my son, Benaya, and um, he brought so much joy in my life as well. But, uh, you know, with, with my son, I was, you know, just thinking about all the things that we were going to do as, as far as football and, and, you know, video games and stand up and just hanging out. And I was just super excited to have, have a son. And at the, the gender reveal party, um, a friend of mine, a mentor, comes up to me pulls me to the side and says, DJ, are you gonna, are you gonna circumcise your son? I was like, I don't mean, I'm not. I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I mean, Sarah and I will talk about it and then a doctor may, I mean, I don't know. And he said, well, well DJ, if you, if you have him circumcised, you need to make sure you're there in the room with him. I was like, okay, okay whatever. Okay, sure. Um, and then over the next couple of months, it, you know, having dinner with his family, he would pull me to the side and like, DJ, I'm serious. If, if he's going to be circumcised, you need to be in the room with him. I'm like, okay, whatever. So 
day of day of my son's birth, and just so you know, that whole process is really very trying on me. It's, it's, very, it's a difficult time for me just because, you know, no one cares about the father, you know, when, when the child is being born. And there's only one bed in the room and it's not for me. And so I'm there on the, the couch there and, and just uncomfortable. And, and no one brings me food and no one's asking about me, but this is my second child, so, so I'm aware of this, so I make sure I, I have some people that are going to be bringing me food. I have snacks in, in my book bag. I have my iPad so I can watch the game Florida State was playing, and, and so I, I'm, I, I'm, I feel set, but, but the, the next day, the day after my son was born, I just I ran out of food. I ran out of my little Debbies, and I'm like, oh my goodness, all my Gatorade, I've drank them all, and, and I'm just I'm hungry and thirsty and and tired. And and this has been a long and and very difficult process for me. And and so I'm just really exhausted. (laughs) And and so I'm I'm there and I'm like not feeling well. And and then the doctor comes in and says, it's time for, for circumcision. And I just want to let you guys know that this story ends well for my son. And, and so I'm, by the way, very important, I've not eaten or drinking anything. Okay, just remember that. That's, my wife tells the story and she throws that part out. So that's that's very important part of the story. And so I'm, I'm walking back there um, to watch my son's circumcision um, per the order of Scott Gottsching. And so I... I'm there, and um, don't don't go watch that. I'm, I'm, I was I was there, and I'm watching, and I'm seeing things, and I begin to sweat, and my mouth begins to water, and my hands go numb, and 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 I begin to feel like I'm about to throw up, and it's not because of anything that's going on. It's just I hadn't eaten anything, or, and so. I'm like, gosh, I'm about to throw them. These doctors are going to think it's because of this procedure that's going on. And I'm really feeling just uh, empty. And, and so I'm like, okay, I, I'm about to throw up. I just got to accept the reality. So I look across the room and I see a trash can. I was like, gosh, if I could just make it a few more minutes, how long is this going to be? And I'm like, could, could y'all just wrap it up real quick? And I'm, <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and I'm like, okay, I'm about to throw up. So I, I just I take one step, two step, three step. Boom, and I just faint right there on the floor, and all the doctors come running toward me, and, and they're like, what in the world's going on? Are you okay? And I'm just busting out laughing. I'm like, it's not because of the procedure. I'm trying to let them know. I just, I haven't eaten anything all day. And they're like, stop talking. And, and I look up, and there's like five doctors all around me. And then I, I notice one of the doctors pulling up a wheelchair, and I'm like, ma'am, I'm not getting in a wheelchair. <laughs> and, and she says, yes, sir, you are. And so I said, Okay. And so I get in the wheelchair, I'm sitting there, and I'm just shaking my head, and I'm like, I'm about to be wheeled into the room where my wife has just birthed my son. And I'd been complaining the whole time. And so, and so she, she wheels me into the room, and my wife looks at me, and she's just laughing, and she couldn't believe it. And, and I, don't, I mean, it was, it was humiliating. But it, it was a hinge moment in my life because... First, I was absolutely humiliated. My wife tells that story to everybody. (laughs) But because my son, my daughter, brings so much joy into my life, we know what hinge moments are. And so in this book of Isaiah, we come to three hinge moments. These are moments in the life of King Hezekiah. And, And King Hezekiah is is a good king. He's a great king. He's prosperous and successful in, in all that he does. We see the account actually in 2 Kings chapter 18 and also in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 that we see that he's a godly king. He's a king that's concerned about the worship of Yahweh and he begins to bring about religious reform in Judah and he, he tears down the Asherah poles and the altars and the high places. He was a godly king. 
We see his name mentioned in the genealogy of, of Jesus. So God was doing something through King Hezekiah. And we see these hinge moments in his life. And I believe if we are willing, I believe that God wants to speak to us about hinge moments. And so let's read Isaiah chapter 36. Let's start in verse 1. It says, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rebshekah, and that's a, an Assyrian a ruler, a commander in the army. It's a, it's a title. It's not a name. He sent the Rebshekah from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And, and there came out to him Eliakim, son of, son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the, Reshep, the Rebshekah said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? On what do you rest this trust of yours? He's asking them, where is your confidence that we're not going to destroy you? We've destroyed all the fortified cities of Judah and you're next. Are you trusting in God? You're trusting in God. All the other nations trusted in God and they have been destroyed. You come out with, with, with mere words, but those aren't strategy for war. Are you trusting in Egypt? We'll destroy Egypt. If we were to give you 2,000 horses, you don't have enough soldiers to mount them, and Egypt doesn't either. And Egypt can't supply you horses. What are you putting this trust that you have in? This word, Shekah, continues and says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. We are coming to destroy you. And he begins to, to speak loudly and like him and Asaph and Shebna say, listen, speak to us in, in Aramaic. We, we understand your language. We, we don't want Judah to, to hear. We don't want Jerusalem to hear your insults. Speak to us in Aramaic. But he counters and says, listen, I'm speaking to Jerusalem. I'm speaking to the men on the wall who will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. I can cut off your food supply and your water supply. You'll be eating yourselves. They ought to know what we're about to do. This is a hinge moment for Jerusalem. Fear and terror, hinge moments often test our faith. And they reveal our fears. How are they going to respond to these insults? This is the hinge of insult. And oftentimes in hinge moments in our life, what happens, what the enemy does is begins to attack with words. If you look at the different battles in scripture, you see the enemy doing this over and over again. If lying is the native tongue of Satan, we have to understand that he's also fluent in insults. When Goliath came against David in Israel, we see him hurling these insults on the people of God. David approaches him and he says, do you think that I'm a dog to send a boy and a stick? I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds. He begins to insult David. Oftentimes, if we have a dream from God, the enemy will begin to speak against our dream, begin to speak against what God has said that God is going to do. We'll begin to curse what God is doing. We have to be careful of our words. There's power in words. God spoke the world into existence. There's this study that was, was done uh, where someone took three different jars of rice. And in one jar, they would say to it, I love you. And the next jar, they would say, I hate you. 
In the next jar, it was the control. And, and after a few days, they would just begin to speak those words, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, to these different jars of rice. And after 50 days, you can see the results that the rice that they said, I hate you, actually molded quite more significantly than the rice that said, they said, I love you, Tim. Now, this is pseudoscience, and a lot of scientists have tried to re, re, you know, reduplicate this experiment. And you can go on YouTube and watch people that have tried this. I want to, just don't think that I'd actually have the time to do it or anything. But, but it's interesting, right? It's interesting, and, and I don't know if this is true. You know, I, you know, this last week I've been you know, opening up my pantry and just, I love you. I, God loves you. you. God has plans for your life to, to feed me and to... Just speaking blessing over the food, just, you know, seeing if it's true or not. I don't know. But we do know that it's true with people, true with our children. Our words are so important. I remember when I was younger, I would go to the paper with crayons and pencils and draw and just don't know what in the world I was doing. But I would be so happy to go to my parents and just show them the, the, the art that I've created. And my mom, bless her heart, so nice. Uh, she would say, wow, DJ, that's so colorful and creative. But she understood something, that there's power in words. The proverb says that there's life and death in the power of the tongue. James chapter three, verse six says the tongue is, is a world of evil among the parts of the body. Some of you in this room can remember specific insults that were spoken over you. Specific things that were said to you. Dreams that were crushed with, with words. You, we, we hear that, that phrase that sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. It's not true. It's not true. Words are so Powerful. We have to be careful with our words. And this Rebshekah is coming against the people of God with these insults. The obstacle is war. What's Isaiah going to do? So Shebna... And this delegation, they come back to Hezekiah and they say, Hezekiah, this is what the Reb Shekha says. And the Reb Shekha says, go and, and tell Isaiah and, and, and ask him to pray for us. And I love the way that Isaiah records this in chapter 37, verse 14. It says, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Have you ever had to spread something before the Lord? To tell God all that was happening. See, there's an obstacle of fear if we get at the root of it, but the opportunity is faith. If we could say doubt and trust. And, and, and there's oftentimes in our life where we come to these obstacles and there's so much doubt. Do we spread it before the Lord? Do we allow God to see everything that's going on? And so he spreads it before the Lord. and He says, God, the nation of Assyria, this powerful army is coming against us. We see what they've done with all the other nations that have trusted in their false gods. Their gods are made by human hands. They're nothing but wood and stone. But God, they come against us now. They're here at Jerusalem and they come and they defy the living God. Would you show yourself strong? If the opportunity, excuse me, if the obstacle was war, then the opportunity is worldwide worship that everybody would see this nation coming against Judah and Jerusalem and they would see God destroy them and see that there is a powerful God. This is exactly what Hezekiah prays. Listen to that last verse 20. So now, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. 
that you alone are the Lord, that they would know. They're trusting in God. Their confidence is in God. But that's not often easy. If we're honest, it's very difficult. And we see that in this next hinge moment in Hezekiah's life. This is the hinge of illness. And we see this in chapter 38. It says, in, in those days, this is actually during the Assyrian invasion before the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were destroyed. It says, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came up to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die, you shall not recover. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. This is a hinge moment in Hezekiah's life. This is difficult news. I couldn't imagine being Isaiah and having to, to come to the king and, and, and utter these words at such a, a hard time in his life where this Assyrian invasion is still happening. To say this, this sickness, this illness that you have is going to result in death. But it says Hezekiah prayed and it says he wept bitterly. And, and Eugene Peterson, his, his paraphrase of, of this verse, it says that he, he cried painful tears. And some of us are familiar with, with painful tears. These are tears that are shed in, in moments where it seems like it's, it's helpless, hopeless, these moments where it seems like there's no way out. It seems like everything is against you. Painful tears. Just this week, I was at a local middle school and, and talking with a staff member during school in the hallway, just making small talk. And then this, this staff member at this school told me that they had actually watched some of the baptisms on Facebook Live and, and was remembering their own baptism. And she began to weep a little bit, and, and then her weeping turned into painful tears right there in the hallway in the middle of school. And this teacher began to, to tell me about her son and the decisions and the obstacles that were confronting her son. And she began to cry painful tears. She began to spread it before the Lord, everything that was happening, all these obstacles. She felt like there was no hope, felt like it was helpless, needing God to do a miracle, crying painful tears. Some of you know these, these moments in our lives. I know there was moments in, in, in my mother's life where she was crying painful tears because she thought that there was no hope for my life that I'd made all of these wrong decisions, that there was no way that, that God was going to move, that there was no way that, that there, anything was going to get to me, crying painful tears, praying day and night that God would get a hold of her son. Can I testify about the mercy of God that he hears our prayers when we cry painful tears? That God draws near to the brokenhearted, that he's present there in our weakness, did you know that there is a, a healing in our tears? In the Psalms, it talks about water. This deer, I, I, I thirst, for, thirst for water as a deer. Thirst, I thirst for water as a, as a deer. It says, night and day, tears have been my food, have been my sustenance. There's a healing in our tears when we cry. And right now we, we see Hezekiah crying these painful tears. 
And the word of the Lord comes to Hezekiah and says that this illness, God has heard your crying. It gives him 15 more years. If the obstacle here is illness, the opportunity is actually inheritance. So we have to go back to those words of Isaiah because I think Hezekiah missed something. Isaiah told Hezekiah to get his house in order. That's a very important word if you're the king, if you're carrying in you the line of the Messiah to get your house in order, to think about your legacy, to think about your inheritance, to to think about what God is going to do through you. Begin to think about what God is going to do with your children. Begin to think about your legacy, what you're going to leave behind. I think about Buddy and, and his legacy. When he received a word that his life was going to end, he put his house in order, planning churches, making sure that, that he was multiplying himself. He put his house in order. But Hezekiah, what we see in in the next chapter, does something different. He's not thinking about the next generation. He's thinking about himself. Listen to this in Isaiah 39. It says, At the time of Merodach Balan, the son of Baldan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold, the spices, the precious oils, and the whole armory. And then he showed everything in the house, and the whole realm Hezekiah did not leave anything unshown. Verse 3, then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and from where did they come from? Hezekiah replied, they have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will come from you, whom you will father shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. The word of the Lord is good because there will be peace and security in my days. Where were the painful tears at that news? Where was the begging that we saw when he had an illness? Where did that go? Here you have the word of the Lord saying that your own children will be taken off to Babylon. They will become eunuchs. Now, now that is a horrible thing, but if you're carrying the line of the Messiah, where are the painful tears? Where is the begging? Where is the pleading? God, you've seen me walk righteously. God, would you, would you look at what I've done? Would you look at how I've lived a blameless life? Would you look at the religious reforms? This is how he was begging when he became ill. But where are the painful tears when it talks about his own children? See, right now, the hinge was one of invasion. Babylon is coming and they're going to take everything. But the obstacle that got in the way was the treasure. What was in those storehouses? The gold, 
the oil. Jesus says, do not store up treasure on earth. Those things were good. Those things were useful and needed for the kingdom. It's not that he was supposed to not have those things, but they were intended to be for the people. They were intended to be for God's glory. Listen, this is what should have happened. These envoys come and, and they're inquiring about this, this healing that occurred in Hezekiah's life. He was sick. He was to the point of death, but God healed him. And then people from Babylon come and they, they want to inquire what happened. They give him a gift. Hezekiah should have said, listen, there's something you need to know. You're right in saying that I was sick. You're right in knowing that I was healed. But I want to know, I want you to know why. I want you to know what God was doing. See, there is a God. I was to the point of death and I was crying painful tears. And I began to look toward the wall, the wall that seemed insurmountable in my life. And I just began to spread it before the Lord. And I began to pray and ask God, God, would you move in my life? God, would you help me? And God healed me. And, and, and Hezekiah was to testify to the goodness of God. But what does he do? He says, come, look around. Look at the gold that I've amassed. Look at my wealth. Look at my riches. He says, I showed him everything. Wanting to be seen as wealthy and successful, prosperous, and in plenty. Failing to, to declare the goodness of God. And this word comes to him that his own children were going to be taken away to Babylon. There's no painful tears in his life. I want to show you something. I have... Just a quick illustration with all of these marbles or beads or whatever, but I want to show you this. I think this is pretty cool. So I mentioned that I have a little daughter, Jubilee. She's just about three years old. And so I did the math, and what I did was I, I counted all the different weeks, assuming that she is with us for 18 years. These are the weeks that we have lived with, that she's lived with us already. And God willing, these are the weeks that we will have with her until she graduates from high school. And I was surprised to see like how many were, were in this jar, this glass jar. And thinking about this jar doesn't seem like a ton. And I just began to realize just how precious one week with my daughter is. Just one week. It just continues to fill up. And this one continues to empty as the weeks go by. And these weeks suddenly become precious. It's not just you be running around and destroying everything and, and just wondering could you just watch a show for another hour <laughs> and Dave and Ava and little baby bum and just all these different things. I just begin to think about these weeks that go by these weeks where I can speak life into her. These, these weeks where I could spend with her now in my house, looking at her smile, the way that she laughs these weeks. Some of you understand just how fast this goes these weeks, but Hezekiah was concerned about the treasure in his kingdom. He was not concerned about his lineage and his legacy. He was thinking about the treasure. You know, if the obstacle was the treasure that he had, the opportunity was treasuring the treasure that he really had. Treasuring what God had entrusted him with. This messianic line, making sure that 
the testimony of who God is and was and will be and the way that God moved in his life, healing him from this sickness, the way that God saved him from this attacking army of Assyria, the way that God showed himself strong, why he decided to do these religious reforms. Hezekiah had an opportunity to leave a legacy for Jerusalem and for Judah and for Israel. But do you know who the next king of Judah was? Was Manasseh. The worst king in the history of Israel. The worst king. How could that be? Hezekiah was a great king and a godly king, but with that last 15 years, something happened in those last 15 years. He didn't put his house in order. He he didn't have his priorities in the right place. See, we might not have treasures of gold and oil, but we do have treasures of jars of clay. Not jars of glass, but jars of clay. And I understand something about my children, that there is a possibility, there's a reality that they may be pressed on every side, but they will not be crushed. That there may be hard times, that they be perplexed, but they will not be destroyed. I understand that in their life they carry something precious. I understand that my children are treasure. And I treasure their life and I pray that God continues to give me opportunities and times and seasons where I can pour into their lives because the next generation matters. We cannot sit well with the fact that there's an obstacle that faces this generation. We cannot sit well like Hezekiah as Babylon comes. We have to be people that are pleading to God God, would you save this generation? This, listen, how often do people negatively talk about the next generation? Every single time. Oh, this generation, they're, they're this, they're lazy, they, they're always on this, or they're always about that. We have to speak life into the next generation. No, this generation cares. This generation is creative. No, this generation can do things for God. This generation is powerful. God is going to use this generation to do something in the world. We have to be people that speak life into the next generation, present and powerful. We we tell the next generation that they live in the land of opportunity. But we must also tell them that they're in a world full of obstacles. And this illustration is still meaningful if you do not have children. This illustration is still impactful if it's just you. Because we're to number our own days. Ephesians 5 talks about living wisely, not as unwise, for the days are evil. Satan prowls around like a lion seeking to destroy. But we have to be people that number our days and understand that each day that we have from God is a gift from God to to glorify God, to tell the next generation about the goodness of God. And those moments in our life where we're crying painful tears, where there's illness, there's insults that come and attack us, would we remember the responsibility? Would we remember this huge meta narrative that God is doing something in the world? And would we trust God with our life, even though it's difficult, and even though those, those obstacles are real? We would trust God to show God's self strong and powerful so that the next generation may hear of the goodness of God. Let's pray. God, I look at these marbles in these glass jars, and and I think about the next generation 
the responsibility that we have to pour into children and students, the responsibility that we have and the opportunity that we have to join you in the work that you're doing in the world, to partner with you, bringing restoration and redemption and reconciliation to this world that's full of obstacles. But God, you have set forth your church in this world to be a light in darkness, to be people marked by love, not so concerned about ourselves and, and our well-being. God, if we cry tears, would we cry tears for the next generation? If we cry tears, would we cry tears for our neighbors? If we cry tears, painful tears, God, would we know that you see our tears? You see our illness. And you do promise healing, whether in this life or in the life to come. You promise to wipe every tear from our eyes. You promise to bring restoration to our bodies, to our homes, to bring restoration to this world. God, we pray that you would hear from heaven and that you would move and that your church would trust you. We would trust your word. Oh God, I think about this next generation. Our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. Oh God, we pray. Move amongst your people. Move amongst your people. Amen.